This beautiful car is a 1930 Packard, and coincidentally, it happens to be of the same year, 1930, in which we introduced Motorola to the world. It all began on the banks of the Mississippi at Quincy, Illinois, when young Wavering and a friend had a bright idea, an idea that would turn a workshop into a company and the company into a communications giant. In those days, half the town used to come down to watch the sunsets, and uh, gee, I thought it'd be a good idea to have music in the car, and uh, I uh, took the idea to Paul Galvin, and he said, go ahead and try it, and let's see how it works. Paul Galvin and his brother Joe envisioned what would become one of the most important communications markets in the world, and on that market, they built a company called Motorola. Producing the first practical and affordable car radio was an enormous challenge. Radios were heavy, easily overwhelmed by ignition noise. They needed complex antennas and extra batteries, so it was a big moment when Wavering's little team finally got one to work while the car was moving. And move it did. For the automobile meant mobility, and broadcast radio meant communication. Together, they would help create from a scattering of small towns and cities a nation that embraced a continent. Radio meant the ability to send and receive information anywhere instantly. It was the beginning of what we today call electronics. Calling all cars, calling all cars. Motorola helped to bring the police into the 20th century by putting two-way radios in their cruisers, which in the 1930s was truly revolutionary. Today, communication radios are everywhere. Some are called cellular phones, others are pagers. Walkie-talkies are simply what are known as two-ways. And a lot of it started with those early police radios. In the 1930s, Motorola radios were largely hand-wired, assembled by individuals. It was more important to me to do a, a good job and that we wouldn't have any complaints that any of the units are unfit to use. When I finished up my, my work, it was a masterpiece to me. There was something about the Motorola spirit, if you will, or the Motorola family that made everybody want to do their best. Everybody that worked for Motorola was part of the family. I think the spirit came from the Galvins themselves. Virtually all of them were the kind of people that had good values, they had senses of responsibility. It seemed that everywhere we turned, virtually everyone had some very significant value that they contributed. Paul Galvin traveled to Europe in the years before World War II, where he saw the rise of military might and sensed the imminence of war. Galvin asked Motorola's best engineers to develop reliable battlefield communication systems for the U.S. Army, even though there was as yet no official government interest in any such radios. Sadly, events proved Galvin right. Motorola almost immediately began shipping the first of more than 130,000 handy talky field radios, the world's smallest and toughest sending and receiving unit. Motorola soon developed the even more powerful walkie-talkie utilizing the FM frequency band for more range and clarity. Motorola's government work was the basis for post-war commercial two-way systems such as the one installed in Ford's enormous River Rouge plant, linking all the departments of the world's largest factory. After the war, Motorola continued to produce new, dynamic, and highly competitive consumer products, and the experience they had gained became a primary strength as the age of transistors and television dawned. 
in my opinion, television has really come of age. It's no longer a medium of entertainment only, but it's become a very important factor in influencing public opinion. Motorola, world's largest exclusive electronic manufacturer, presents... But even Paul Galvin couldn't have foreseen how his predominantly consumer electronics company would grow with the introduction of powerful new electronic components called semiconductors. Good evening. How would you like to own a truly portable television set that you could take to the beach or a picnic? Here's what it might look like. Interested? Many are. But of course it hasn't been invented yet. Someday, however, it will be, with the help of this little electronic marvel of the future, the transistor. It was not something that was going to make money for the company then, and it really wasn't sure that it would ever make money for anybody. It was a new technology. The fact that the company is in the business today reflects the influence of one person, Dan Noble. In the equipment of the future, the complete electronic system will be an assembly of a small number of integrated circuits as opposed to the presently designed assembly of a large number of interconnected resistors, condensers, coils, and transistors. But first, the new Phoenix division had to figure out how to manufacture semiconductors economically. It was a brand new industry, and the techniques and technology were still being developed even as the factories were being built. This wasn't just on-the-job training. It was on-the-job inventing. One day, mine and Lincoln and I were over at Montgomery Ward's. They had a zigzag sewing machine operating there. And we both took a look at it, and we both got the same idea at the same time. That motion of that zigzag sewing machine could simulate the motion of picking up a die and putting it down on the strip. So we bought the sewing machine, and we played with it, and we got it working. And that was the first die attach equipment. All die attach machines today. 25 years later, basically work on that same principle. Later on, Motorola was not satisfied that it could make a transistor for a dollar. The leader of the semiconductor division said to his troops, hey guys, how long you think you're gonna get a buck a piece for these? Somebody's gonna figure out how to make them for 10 cents. Why don't you? He was right. It paid off and Motorola ended up a world leader in the high volume manufacture of transistors because it developed a new way of making them. By 1974, Motorola had become a technology leader, not a follower. The semiconductor technology Motorola developed meant the company would never again be simply a producer of consumer goods. The tiniest products that Motorola had ever manufactured wrought the largest changes ever imagined in the company's destiny. Ten, nine, ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. The space age. For us, it began with Explorer. Then, Ranger radioed back the first live close-ups of the lunar surface. But manned flight was the crucible that fired the nation's spirit and imagination. Beautiful. Motorola was an integral part of the space program from its inception, and the words of every astronaut were communicated over Motorola radios. Neil Armstrong's words were among them. Motorola had equipment on all manned spacecraft, including the first automobile radio on the moon. Today, Motorola flies on the shuttle, communications equipment so refined and reliable that Earth orbit is hardly an area code away. An unmanned probe is mute without a data link to communicate its priceless discoveries back to Earth. 
Motorola radios provided that link for Viking and Voyager. For a Voyager engineer, patience was a virtue since it took 15 years for the project to begin to truly pay off. By the time you get out to 3 billion miles, you're receiving signals a billion times less sensitive than you would have in a typical AM, FM radio. Most people have, are familiar with 100 watt light bulb, certainly. That's the total power consumed by that whole radio and the whole communication link. It gives you some idea of the kind of technology that one has to use to be able to communicate at these large distances. The 1970s and 80s. Semiconductors and microprocessor technology had become the core of the company. These miracles of miniaturization and the software that drove them found their way into virtually everything that Motorola made, including electronics that controlled much of the modern automobile. The walkie-talkie makes its debut at a hospital. Paging Dr. X, he listens to the message and if necessary Motorola can pioneered the board. pagers that delivered radio messages. In the 1980s, the Bravo pager, which displayed your caller's phone number, became the world's best seller. Today, Motorola pagers can even receive email and computer text. To compete in an expanding international marketplace, we had to totally rethink the way Motorola designed and manufactured pagers, and also everything else we made. This was the beginning of our Six Sigma Quality Initiative and a renewed emphasis on total customer satisfaction. Motorola was among the first to sense the need for portable telephones. Fifteen years and $150 million later, Motorola was ready with the Dynatac cellular phone system. The technology is called cellular because each service area is divided into smaller areas called cells. In 1989, the Microtax cell phone married Motorola miniaturization and microchip design to the needs of people on the move. The StarTac wearable phone continued this tradition in the 1990s. Motorola cell phones have become the world standard and cellular systems are being installed on every continent in every corner of the globe. Today, the Motorola family knows no borders and a transnational workforce enriches the spirit of the company. From car radios to cell phones, Motorola has strived to be a leader, investing in people and technology that promise to improve the way we all live and work. Now, the next chapter in the quest for the technology of tomorrow, the Iridium system. With the Iridium system, we can telephone with no limits. A fleet of low-orbit satellites amplifies and leapfrogs the signals from your portable phone to anybody else's anywhere in the world truly global communications, and that's where Motorola has always been heading, getting the message across any distance, using any means, accepting no barriers. Microelectronics, radio, satellites, Motorola brings them all together, the dawn of a wireless world. A disaster specialist coordinates earthquake relief in Bolivia by wireless telephone. A driver in Cairo tracks a package through a data link to Connecticut. A scientist in Antarctica calls a database in California to downlink information on the ozone layer. A rally driver sends data on engine performance from the Sahara to headquarters in Sweden. A construction crew in China conducts a three-way video conference with architects in Hong Kong and engineers in Hawaii. Communications capabilities ready to make our world more productive, more convenient, more enjoyable. 
This will be Motorola's legacy. The legacy of a company with history, traditions, and values that have always led it to innovate, to grow, to improve, to succeed.